In this presentation, we're going to take a look at the scriptural books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And then at the end, we'll take a look at the book of Jude and what it teaches us about Christ coming unto him, gaining exaltation, and some of the warnings that these ancient prophets gave to the people then, which also apply to us today. We will begin with the book of 1 John, which has five chapters, 1 John chapters 1 through 5. So first, here is 1 John chapter 1, Introduction. The epistle of 1 John 1 was written at a time when apostasy was spreading in the church. In this epistle, John addresses the dangerous spread of apostate influences in the church and gave an apostolic warning to the saints to have no fellowship with darkness, but to stay in the safety of gospel light. Although some of the false teachings that John referred to in this epistle are different from those prevalent in the world today, studying 1 John can help modern church members become more discerning of false teachings about Jesus Christ, and following John's counsel can help them maintain close fellowship with the Lord as they abide in the truth. The audience of 1 John is not explicitly stated in form, 1 John is more of a doctrinal essay of treatises than an epistle to a specific Christian congregation. John wrote to believers, perhaps those of ancient Asia Minor, that's a modern-day Turkey, where historical sources say John lived and ministered in the late 1st century A.D. False teachers had created a schism or division among the saints in that region. See 1 John 2, 18 through 19, 22, 26, then chapter 4, 1. A particular philosophy that was gained popularity at the time of Docetism, and I hope I'm saying that right, Docetism was a part of a larger movement known as Gnosticism. A core teaching in many forms of Gnosticism was that the spirit was wholly good and that matter, including the physical body, was wholly evil. Followers of Gnosticism believed that salvation was not achieved by being freed from sin, but rather by freeing the spirit from matter, meaning the physical body. They also believed that salvation was achieved through special knowledge called Gnosis, or Gnosis rather than through faith in Jesus Christ. Followers of Gnosis or Docetism overemphasized Jesus' spiritual nature to point that they rejected the idea that he came in earth in actual bodily form. They believed that God was invisible, immortal, all-knowing, and immaterial, and they considered the physical world and the physical body as a, to be base and evil. Therefore, they believed that since Jesus was the, son of, the divine Son of God, he could not have experienced the limitations of being human. In this view, Jesus Christ was not literally born in the flesh, and he did not inhabit a tangible body, bleed, suffer, die, or raise with a physical resurrected body. He only seemed to do these things. Docetism comes from the Greek dokio, meaning to seem or to appear. So, I'm sorry for the typo. This is an introduction to all of First John, not just chapter 1. And so there's this false doctrine of Gnosticism that has crept into the church that denounces the physical reality of Jesus Christ and that he was only a spirit and of a spiritual nature. John refuted these false teachings by bearing witness of the Savior's physical existence. He declared that Jesus Christ indeed came to earth in the flesh, that he suffered and and that his suffering and death made up his redeeming act, and that God sent his Son because of his great love for us. One of Jesus Christ's original apostles, John was a special witness of the resurrected Savior. John began his letter by declaring that he had personally seen, 
heard, and touched the resurrected Jesus Christ. Expanding on this personal witness, John invited his readers to have fellowship not only with John and those who ministered with him, but also with the fathers and with his son, Jesus Christ. Love is a central theme of John's first epistle. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, summarized 1 John's theme of divine love as follows. He did not inhabit, oh, as follows, I'm sorry, that God is love, that love is the foundation upon which all personal righteousness rests, that all the purposes and plans of deed are based on his infinite and eternal love. And that if men will pers- that if men will personify that love in their lives, they will become like the Lord Himself and have eternal life with Him. Joseph Smith wrote, "Nothing so much calculated to lead people to forsake sin as to take them by the hand and watch over them with tenderness. When persons manifest the least kindness and love to me, oh, what power it has over my mind!" while the opposite course has a tendency to harrow up all the harsh feelings and depress the human mind. So with that introduction, let's take a look at 1 John chapter 1. Saints gain fellowship with God by obedience. 1 John 1, verses 1 through 4, apostolic witness from the beginning. John, in combating Gnostic philosophy, spoke of how he and others had personally seen, heard, and touched the resurrected Jesus Christ. John apparently wanted his readers to understand that he was writing this letter as his personal witness of the resurrected Christ. John's testimony of Jesus Christ and his role in our salvation powerfully refuted the false teachings that were then entering into the church. For John and Peter and Paul God the Father and his biological son, Jesus, are separate and distinct personages. The gospel John preaches will bring a fullness, the gospel John preaches will bring a fullness of joy. We see an uh, overhold of this false doctrine even today in traditional Christianity where they do not believe that God has a physical, tangible body. So you can see how this false doctrine had carried on throughout ages and is still with us today. 1 John 3, verse 1. That which was from the beginning. The Lord Jesus Christ in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1, 1, 1. I apologize. I think this is a typo, and it should be 1 John 1, 1. Not three. I apologize for that. So 1 John 1, 1, that which was from the beginning, the Lord Jesus Christ, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, John 1, 1, which we have heard that he is God's Son through whose gospel salvation comes. The phrase seen, looked, our hands have handled, meant we were with him in the upper room after his resurrection we saw his person and looked upon his face we heard him say behold my hands and my feet that it is i myself and we accepted his invitation handle me and see for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have that was luke 4, 24 39 we know he is the son of god because he rose from the dead we are witnesses The phrase in this verse, the word of life, meant the Son of God who was in the beginning with the Father, the messenger of salvation, who carried the Father's message of eternal life to all the sons of men, the life of the world. 1 John chapter 1 verse 2, the phrase, the life was manifested, meaning in him was life, meaning Christ, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. That's in the Gospel of John 1, 4 through 5. 
The phrase that eternal life, which was with the Father, means eternal life is the name of the kind of the life God lived by God, the eternal Father. Eternal life is God's life. This life is manifested to all men through the gospel and is rewarded to all those who love the whole law of the whole gospel. 1 John chapter 1 verse 3, that ye also may have fellowship with us. John wrote that one purpose of his letter was to help his readers have fellowship with those who had seen and heard Jesus Christ and then in turn enjoy fellowship with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. See the epistle of John 1.3. Fellowship includes the ideas of communion, partnership, and sharing a common life. Elder Bruce R. McConkie taught, quote, to have fellowship with the Lord in this life is to enjoy the companionship of the Holy Spirit, and have fellowship with Him in eternity is to be like Him, having the eternal life of which He is the possessor and originator, end of quote. John taught that in order to have fellowship with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, we must become like them. Therefore, we should walk in the light, applying the atoning blood of Jesus Christ, confess and repent of our sins, keep the commandments, and love one another. Chapter 1, verse 3, the phrase, ye also may have fellowship with us, John was meaning. Fellowship connotes a community of interest, activity, and feeling. It is the association enjoyed by a group of equal friends. And in the church, it is not the apostles only who are to see and hear and know and understand and feel and handle. It is all the saints who have fellowship with them. For God hath not revealed anything to Joseph, but what he will make known unto the twelve. And even the least saint may know all things as fast as he is able to bear them. For the day must come when no man need say to his neighbor, Know ye the Lord, for all shall know him who remain from the least to the, to the greatest. And that was a quote by Joseph Smith. The phrase, Our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, meant John himself, soon to be translated, is in the same state of fellowship with the Lord, which was enjoyed by the three soon-to-be-translated Nephite disciples, to the whom the Lord said, quoting 3 Nephi 28.10, Ye shall have fullness of joy, and ye shall sit down in the kingdom of my Father. Yea, your joy shall be full, full, even as the Father hath given me fullness of joy. And ye shall be even as I am, and I am even as the Father, and the Father and I are one. End of quote. Thus John here is saying, our fellowship is with the Father and the Son. We are one with them. They accept us as friends, and we shall be equal in power, in might, and in dominion. See Doctrine and Covenants 7695. In that glorious day when we receive of their fullness and grace. To have fellowship with the Lord in this life is to enjoy the companionship of His Holy Spirit, which makes us one with Him. And to have fellowship with Him in eternity is to be like Him, having that eternal life of which He is possessor and originator. John chapter 1 verses 5 through 10, walking in light instead of darkness. John wrote that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. The idea that God is light is found elsewhere in John's writings and other scriptures. Those who seek fellowship with God must leave the darkness of sin in order to walk in the light of Christ. We deceive ourselves when we ignore our sins or say that we have no sin. Let's now turn to 1 John chapter 2, Christ is our advocate with the Father. 1 John 2, 1, My Little Children John sometimes referred to church members in the areas in which he ministered as his little children. This term can be seen as one of endearment, much like when Paul referred to Timothy as his son. Note that in 1 John 2, 13, little children appears to refer to actual children who were members of the church. The phrase little children is used similarly in the Gospel of John 13.33 and Doctrine and Covenants section 78.17. 1 John 2 
verses 1 through 2 and 410, our advocate and propitiation. John called the Savior our advocate with the Father and the propitiation for our sins. An advocate is a person who supports or pleases the cause, pleads the cause of another person. Because Jesus Christ was perfectly righteous and satisfied the demands of justice for the sins of others, he is qualified to plead on our behalf before the Father. Doctrine of Covenants 45, 3-5 says, quote, Listen to him who is the advocate with the Father, who is pleading your cause before him, saying, Father, behold the sufferings and death of him who did no sin, in whom thou wast well pleased. Behold the blood of thy Son which was shed, the blood of him whom thou gavest, that thou thyself might be glorified. Wherefore, Father, spare these my brethren that believe on my name, that they may come unto me and have everlasting life. End of quote. A propitiation is a sacrifice made to regain God's favor or goodwill. Jesus Christ is the sacrifice that allows us to regain God's favor. The Savior endured the suffering due to due for the accumulated sins of the whole world. However, only those who truly repent will receive the full benefits of the Savior's atonement. 1 John chapter 2, 3 through 6, keeping God's commandments. Obedient to God's commandments is an important theme in John's writings. It expressed in 1 John 2, 3 through 6. In his gospel, John recorded Jesus' teaching that those who love the Savior keep his commandments. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Gospel of John 15, 10. It's chapter 2, verse 3, the phrase, we know him if we keep his commandments, means that John, who recorded in his gospel account the great intercessory prayer in which Jesus taught that life Eternal consists in knowing the Father and the Son. See John 17, 3. Now announces how it is possible to know God. It is by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel, and in no other way. Which is to say, among other things, there is not one scintilla of spiritual sense in the sectarian supposition that salvation is gained simply by saying, I accept Jesus as my personal Savior. That does not get you to come to know Jesus Christ. Since the very fact of knowing God in the ultimate and full sense consists of thinking what he thinks, saying what he says, doing what he does, and being like him, thus having exaltation or godhood, it follows that saved souls must advance and progress until they acquire his character, perfections, and attributes, until they gain his eternal power, until they themselves become gods. And thank goodness we have this life and the next life to work on that. 1 John chapter 2, 7-8 through 8, Brethren, I write unto you about the new and everlasting covenant, which is revealed anew unto you but which is also the same gospel had from the beginning. It was ordained of God for the salvation of his children and is true, as all of you know, for you have passed from the darkness of the world into its true light. See the Joseph Smith changes for these verses in the footnotes. I'm sorry. You were at. Hit the button one, one, one too many times. First John two nine through eleven. Light dispels darkness. In this epistle, John repeatedly contrasts light with darkness and encourages readers to abide in the light. John associated light with love and darkness with hate. See 1 John 2, 9 through 11. When we love others, we invite the light of Christ to eliminate our lives. Elder Robert D. Hells of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles taught how we might dispel darkness from our life and walk in the light. Quote, 
As children, we learn how to keep darkness away by turning on a light. Sometimes, when our parents went away for the evening, we would turn on every light in the house. We understood the physical law that is also a spiritual law. Light and darkness cannot occupy the same space at the same time. Light dispels darkness. When light is present, darkness is vanquished and must depart. More importantly, darkness cannot conquer light unless the light is diminished or departs. See, isn't it interesting? You can turn on light, but isn't it interesting? You cannot go to a switch and turn on darkness. The only way you get darkness is you have to turn off the light. When the spiritual light of the Holy Ghost is present and darkness of Satan departs, we are, encouraged, we are engaged in a battle between the forces of light and darkness. If it were not for the light of Jesus Christ and his gospel, we would be doomed to the destruction of darkness. End of quote. If we claim to be Christians and to have the light of the gospel in our lives and yet hate our brethren, we are in fact in darkness. If we live the gospel, we love our brethren and are on the path leading to eternal life. If we hate our brethren, we have strayed unto by and forbidden paths and are enveloped by mists of darkness which blind us to the truth. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? That's Matthew 6, 33. 1 John 2, 12 through 14. These verses contain the effective teaching formula, I write unto you. The intended audience, little children, young men, and fathers encompass the whole church and is reminiscent of modern prophets who have dressed remarks to all segments and age groups of the Lord's people. Chapter 2, verse 12, the phrase little children, meaning members of the church who have taken upon themselves the, names of Christ, the name of Christ and are accounted as his sons and his daughters, and who now need to grow to that spiritual maturity inherent in the attainment of eternal life. The phrase, your sins are forgiven you, meaning through baptism and the cleansing power of the Holy Ghost. Chapter 2, verse 13, I write, and chapter 2, verse 14, I have written, mean, apparently John is saying, I now write you this epistle, but I have already written you my gospel, and through the word of God that abideth in him, they had overcome the wicked one. 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17, the love of the world is diametrically opposed to the love of God. Note the prominent place of lust and pride in the scheme of the world. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, the phrase, love not the world, meaning not the earth or planet, not the earth or planet upon which we dwell, but the social conditions created by such of the inhabitants of the earth as live carnal, sensual, lustful lives and have not put off the natural man by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. The phrase, the love of the Father is not in him, meant no man can love God and rebel against in him. Love is measured in obedience and service. If you keep my commandments, Jesus said. If you love me, keep my commandments, Jesus said. And then the reverse would also be implied. If you keep his commandments, then we love Jesus. It follows that one cannot love both the Lord and the world. It isn't like trying to serve both God and mammon. For either you will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Matthew 6, 24. 1 John 2, 16, the phrase, the lust of the flesh, meaning appetites and passions which are carnal, sensual, and devilish, in their most common and evil form, they involve unbridled and illicit sexual acts and perversions. The phrase, the lust of the eyes, meaning looking upon carnality, sensuality, and devilish with approval and desire as looking upon a woman to lust after her, thus committing adultery with her in your heart, in the heart. The pride of life phrase, see 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, 13, Paul speaks here of the, 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 the direful 
spiritual darkness that covers the earth in the dispense, dispensation, dis, dispensation of the fullness of times, the seeds of which were even then sprouting among the Meridian Saint Christians. The Aramaic, that's the language that was common person spoken in Israel in the time of Christ, even Christ would have spoken Aramaic, version is more expressive. Here's how the Aramaic reads of 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. Verse 1, know this, that in the last days disastrous times will come. Verse 2, and men shall be lovers of themselves and lovers of money, proud, conceited, blasphemers, disobedient to their own people, ungrateful, wicked. Verse 3, false accusers, addict, addict addicts to lust, including homosexual. See 2 Timothy 3.3 3, footnote B. Brutal haters of good things. Verse 4, traitors, hasty, boasters, lovers of pleasure more than the lovers of God. Verse 5, having a form of godliness, but, by, but far from the power of God, from such turn away. Verse 6, for of these sort are those who creep into houses and captivate women sunken in sin, lead away with diverse lusts. Verse 7, ye of ever striving to learn and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Ever learning the philosophy of men, but not receiving the saving truths of the revealed religion. Ever learning intellectual abstractions which purport to show the whence, why, and whither of life, but not turning to God and his prophets to find the simple saving truths. Salvation is not found in much learning. It has little to do with educational degrees and intellectual powers. The truths that save are gospel truths whose source is revelation. Revelation to spiritual people who may or may not also be intellectual. Chapter 313. The millennium will not be ushered in because men repent and turn to God, or because mankind generally becomes more upright and wholesome. Sin and evil shall increase from day to day until the Lord comes. Every form of corruption shall exceed its counterpart of the past until the cup of the iniquity shall be full. Then the Lord shall re return to cleanse the vineyard and the wicked shall be destroyed. 1 John chapter 2 verses 18 through 19 and verse 26 and then 4 verse 3, Antichrist. Speaking of false teachers among the saints, John warned that even now there are many antichrists. An antichrist is anyone or anything that counterfeits the true gospel plan of salvation and that openly or secretly opposes Christ. Prior to his death, the Savior had warned his disciples about the coming of false Christ. Chapter 2, verse 18, the phrase, the last time, meaning, to the Marinian saints, it seemed as though the last days were upon them because the apostasy de destined to occur between the first and second coming of the Lord had already commenced. However, the last days during which their Lord would return, in, in fact, the Lord would in fact return, were not destined to come to pass until our day. 1 John 2, Verse 20 and 27, an unction from the Holy One. Even as John pointed out how Antichrist were at work within the church, he assured the saints that an unction from the Holy One would allow them to know all things as they sought to resist false ideas. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained the meaning of the word unction in this verse. Quote, Literally, an unction is the act of anointing as with oil for medicinal purposes. Figuratively, it is an anointing from on high, meaning those who so endowed receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Thus John said of the saints, ye have an unction from the Holy One, and you know all things. That is, they have received the Holy Ghost, so the spirit of revelation and the knowledge rested with them. 1 John 2.21, the phrase, no lie is of the truth, meaning everything connected with the Lord's system of revealed religion is true. There is no intermixture of truth and error. It is not, it is not a matter of consensus or mathematical probability. Truth is truth. 
and when God speaks truth alone flows forth. The term liar in this verse refers in general in the general dealings of men, those who knowingly utter or act out falsehood are liars. This is also true in the gospel sense, but according to scriptural standards, the sin of lying also branches out include, to include a much larger group of persons. Scripturally, anything that in its nature is untrue and is therefore destined to deceive is a lie. Those who believe in false doctrines are this guilty of believing a lie, and those who propagate these untruths are guilty of lying. For instance, the creeds of apostate Christendom teach untruths about God, and the scriptures say that those who accept these creeds have inherited lies. That's Jeremiah 16, verses 16 through 21. Those who accept any of the doctrines of the apostate churches are said to believe a lie. 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 12. The process of apostasy consists in changing the truth of God into a lie. Alma taught that all who do not hearken to the voice of the good shepherd are part of the devil's fold, and then he added, whosoever denieth this is a liar. Alma 5, 38, 4-40. Sherem confessed after being smitten, I have lied unto God, for I denied the Christ. False teachers are liars. Conversely, Mormon concluded some of his expositions of truth by saying, I lie not. In other words, to teach true doctrine is to tell the truth, and to teach false doctrine is to lie. 1 John 2.23 The Father and the Son go together. To believe in one is to believe in the other. To reject one is to reject the other. To love one is to love the other. He that hateth me hateth my Father also, said John in the Gospel of John 15.23. 1 John 2, 24-25, and then chapter 2, 24, Continue to believe the everlasting gospel, so that ye shall inherit eternal life. Chapter 2, 25, the phrase, He hath promised us eternal life, meaning every member of the church has the promise of eternal life on the conditions of obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. To those who are baptized and who then endure to the end, the Lord says, Ye shall have eternal life. 1 John 2.26, the phrase, Them that seduce you, meaning those who teach false doctrines and lead the saints away from the paths of truth and righteousness. 1 John 2.27, our inspired apostolic author who had aforetime recorded Jesus' promise that the Comforter would teach them all things and bring all things to their remembrance and that he would guide them in all truth now announces the fulfillment of the promise. The glorious, glorious gift has in reality come to them. Quote, ye have an unction from the Holy One, he says, and ye therefore know all things. First John 2.20 this unction, this holy anointing, is the gift of the Holy Ghost, which gives them access to the infinite wisdom of the Father and the Son, so that they may know all things as fast as they are able to bear them. The phrase, the anointing, meaning literally to pour oil upon one as part of a sacred rite, figuratively as here, to receive an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that is, to receive not alone a flash of spiritual insight, as may be the case in the life of any sincere investigator of the truth, but to receive a manifold outpouring of this greatest of all gifts, to actually receive the companionship of this member of the Godhead. Ye need not that any man teach you, that phrase Paul, or John was meaning, ye are not sent forth to be taught, but to teach the children of men the things which I have put into your hands by the power of my Spirit, and ye are to be taught from on high. Doctrine and Covenants 43, 15 through 16. First John 2, 28, abide in him, phrase meaning, abide meaning to stay with forever in Christ. Keep the commandments, work the works of righteousness. 
John 15, 5 through 7, the Gospel of John says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in he, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. And that is the truth. Without Christ we are and can become nothing. Back to the scripture. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. El David a. Bednar of the Quorum of the Twelve explained, The Lord Jesus Christ extends to each of us his invitation to abide in him. But how do we actually learn and come to abide in him? The word abide denotes remaining fixed or stable and enduring without yielding. Elder Jeffrey Allharland explained that abiding as an action means to stay, but to stay forever. That is the call of the gospel message to everyone in the world. Come, but come to remain. Come with conviction and endurance. Come permanently for your sake and the sake of all the generations who must follow you. Thus we abide in Christ as we are firm and steadfast in our devotion to the Redeemer and his holy purposes in times both good and bad. Continuing his quote, we begin to abide in the Lord by exercising our moral agency to take upon ourselves his yoke through the covenant and ordinances of the restored gospel. The covenant connected, the covenant connection we have with our Heavenly Father and his resurrection and living Son is the supernal source of perspective, hope, power, peace, and enduring joy. It also is the rock-solid foundation upon which we should build our lives. We abide in him by striving continually to strengthen our individual covenant bond with the Father and the Son. For example, praying sincerely to the Eternal Father in the name of his beloved Son deepens and fortifies our covenant connection with them. We abide in him by truly feasting upon the words of Christ. The Savior's doctrine draws us, as his children of the covenant, closer to him and will tell us all things what we should do. We abide in him by preparing earnestly to participate in the ordinances of the sacrament, reviewing and reflecting on our covenant promises and repenting sincerely. Worthily partaking of the sacrament is a witness to God that we're willing to take upon ourselves the name of Christ and strive to always remember him after the brief period of time required to participate in that sacred ordinance. And we abide in him by serving God as we serve his children and minister to our brothers and sisters. The Savior said, If you keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. I briefly have described several of the many ways we can abide in the Savior, and I now invite each of us as his disciples to ask, seek, knock, and learn for ourselves by the power of the Holy Spirit other meaningful ways we can make Christ the center of our lives in all that we do. End of quotation. 1 John 2.29 by doing what Christ did, we partake of his nature, become like him, are transformed into his image, and are thus spiritually born of him. We now turn to 1 John chapter 3, Sons of God shall become like Christ. 1 John 3, 1 through 3, the sons of God have the potential to become like him. John called the saints the sons of God and said that when we shall appear, we shall be like him. This is one of the many biblical passages that teaches about man's potential to become like God and his son, Jesus Christ. So this is a good scripture to any of those who chide you or put you down by saying, oh, you Mormons believe you can become like God. There's nothing in the Bible about that. Well, there is in 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. President Dallin H. Oaks, the first president, since he explained the purpose of mortal life is to become like God through the atonement of Jesus Christ. Quote, 
in the theology of the restored church of Jesus Christ, the purpose of mortal life is to prepare us to realize our destiny as sons and daughters of God, to become like Him. The Bible describes mortals as the children of God and as heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. It also declares that we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together, and that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. We take these Bible teachings literally. We believe that the purpose of mortal life is to acquire a physical body. And through the atonement of Jesus Christ and by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel, to qualify for the glorified, resurrected celestial state that is called exaltation or eternal life. This destiny of eternal life or God's life should be familiar to all who have studied the ancient Christian doctrine of the belief in deification or apotheosis. Our theology begins with heavenly parents. Our highest aspiration is to be like them. Under the merciful plan of the Father, all of this is possible through the atonement of the only begotten of the Father, our, our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. End of quote. President Oaks referred to the early Christian doctrines of deification, the idea that human beings can become like God. This doctrine continued to be taught by many Christian writers after the death of the apostles. For example, the Bishop Cyprian, Cyprian in about 258 A.D., wrote, what man is, Christ was willing to be, that man also be what Christ is. What Christ is, we Christians shall be if we imitate Christ. So here we have this teaching still being taught long after the apostles have died. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, we shall be like him. We shall have exaltation, for that is what he is, and he is like the Father. Thus we also shall be as the Father, which accords with the prophet Joseph Smith's declaration, quote, God himself finding he was in the midst of spirits and glory, because he was more intelligent, saw proper to institute laws whereby the rest could have a privilege to advance like himself, end of quote. Chapter 3, verse 3, what greater incentive could there be to live righteously than the promised hope of eternal life with all that is implicit therein? 1 John 3, 4, definition of sin. John provided a concise definition of sin. Sin is the transgression of the law. 1 John 3, 5, the sinless one came in the world to save sinners on conditions of of repentance. We are not saved from our sins just because God loves us. That is one of the false heresies that is even creeped in the church. Well, God loves me, therefore I'll be saved. No, no, no. no. We will not be saved in our sins. We can only be saved from our sins, and that is on the conditions of repentance. 1 John 3, 6 through 9, do not commit, do not continue in sin. The King James Version of 1 John 3, 6 reads, Whosoever sinneth hath not seen Christ, neither known him. The Joseph Smith translation of 1 John 3, 6 and then 8 through 9 clarifies the difference between one who sins and one who continues in sin. It's quoting Joseph Smith translation 3, 6 says, Whosoever continueth in sin hath not seen him, neither knoweth him. Joseph Smith translation 3 8, he that continueth in sin is of the devil. Joseph Smith translation 3 9, whosoever is born of God doth not continue in sin, for the Spirit of God remaineth in him, and he cannot continue in sin because he is born of God, having received the Holy Spirit of promise. See that in 1 John 3 6 footnote B. And chapter 3, verse 8, footnote A. Chapter 3, verse 9, footnote B. John also contrasted those who chose to continue in sin, con to continue in sin with those who abide in Christ. 1 John 3.10 True saints are known by their works. 
There neither is nor can be any other standard of judgment. By their fruits ye shall know them. Unless and until they do the works of righteousness, they are members of the church in name only, and the gospel is not a living thing in their lives. And so too are the ungodly known by their works. Until they do good and love their fellow men, they are not of God. The phrase is children of God, meaning faithful members of the church, who by spiritual rebirth have been adopted into the family of Christ. The phrase the children of the devil, meaning rebellious persons who serve Satan by means of their evil deeds and who thereby attain kinship with him and are figuratively his offspring. Thus Jesus said to certain Jews, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. That's in the Gospel of John 8, 44. And Paul, in cursing Elamus, the sorcerer, exclaimed, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? That's Acts 13, 10. 1 John 3, 11, love one another. We should love one another is one of John's, John's central messages. He heard this principle taught by the Savior, who is the source of enduring love. Love has been taught from the, the beginning. And on the last night of the Savior's mortal ministry, he taught it again. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. John fifteen twelve. First John three twelve. Why did Cain slay Abel? Because Cain's works were evil, and those of Abel were righteous. Why do worldly people hate the saints? Because the ungodly are living in wickedness, and the saints are keeping the commandments. How simple the answers are when we turn to basic principles. Of course, the wicked and ungodly oppose the church. Such is implicit in their very way of life, for they are sons of Satan children of the devil, followers of him whose whole mission and purpose is to fight against God to seek the misery of all mankind and to stir up the children of men unto secret combinations of murder and all manner of secret works of, not, of darkness. That's from 2 Nephi 9.9. 9. 1 John 3.13-18 If the world hate you. John acknowledged the hostility that church members were facing, encouraging his readers to marvel not if, they, if the world hate you. He then taught that disciples of Jesus Christ have an obligation to love their brethren. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles stated, quote, If you haven't already, you will one day find yourself called upon to defend your faith or perhaps even endure some personal abuse simply because you are a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Such moments will require both courage and courtesy on your part. End of quote. President Dallin H. Oaks similarly taught, as the salt of the earth, we are also the light of the world, and our light must not be hidden. The Apostle John warned that this will cause the world to hate us. That is why those who have made covenants to change have a sacred duty to love and help one another. That encouragement must be extended to every soul who struggles to come out of the culture of the world and into the culture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Apostle John concluded, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. End of quote. 1 John 3.15, the phrase, Whoso hateth his brother is a murderer. John was meaning, How strong is this doctrine? In the eternal perspective, those who hate their fellow men are murderers, whether they shed blood in the literal sense or not. They have committed murder in their hearts and will be judged accordingly even as those who look upon women in lust are numbered with and judged as adulterers. The deeds have been done in the heart. And so Jesus said of the devil, he was a murderer from the beginning. Gospel of John 8.44 Though that enemy of all righteousness did not personally shed blood in pre-existence or after being cast down to earth. The call to repentance and baptism which in 
the call to repentance and baptism, which includes murderers, has reference to those who took life while engaged in unrighteous wars, as did the Lamanites, because they were compelled to do so, and not because they in their hearts sought the blood of their fellow men. On the other hand, the Jews who on whose hands the blood of Christ was found were not invited to repent and be baptized. See Acts 3, 19-21. Murders are forgiven eventually, but only in the sense that all sins are forgiven except sin against the Holy Ghost. They are not forgiven in the sense that celestial salvation is made available to them. After they have paid the full penalty for their crime, they shall go on to a celestial inheritance. Chapter 3, verse 15, the phrase, No murder hath eternal life abiding in him, meaning murder the unlawful killing of a human being with malice aforethought or under certain circumstances of criminality that the malice is presumed is a sin unto death. A sin, I'm sorry for the typo, for which there is not forgiveness, meaning that a murder can never gain salvation. No murder hath eternal life abiding in him, 1 John 3.15. He cannot join the church by baptism. He is outside the pale of redeeming grace. The call to repentance and baptism includes murderers, 3, 3, has reference to those, oh, I'm sorry, that's a repeat that we've already said, reference to those who are compelled to go fight in war. 1 John 3.16, even as Christ manifested perfect love for us and voluntarily laying down his life, so we should be willingly, through love, so, so to sacrifice for each other. 1 John 3.17-18, does the love of God dwell in the hearts of rich members of the church who withhold his substance from his poor and needy brethren? Love is more than words. It also requires compassionate service. 1 John 3, 19, 21, one of the chief evidences of the divinity of the gospel of the true church and of the Lord's work on earth is that it improves the lives of men. The proof of the possession of true religion is the wholesome and edifying effect it has in the lives of its adherents. Thus John testifies, we know we have true religion because our lives are improved by living its precepts. We love God and our fellow men in word and in deed, which thing we could not do in the full measure if we were yet in the world. And I'm going to quickly just erase that thing that we duplicated here. If we keep first if we keep the commandments, let's see. If we keep the commandments and have a clear conscience, we gain confidence that the Lord will bless us. If we do not keep the commandments, we have no such assurance, but are condemned by our own conscience and by God who knoweth all things. First John three twenty two receiving what we pray for. To receive whatsoever we ask of God, we must keep his commandments to do those things that are pleasing in his sight. The Bible dictionary states the object of prayer is not to change the will of God. We are not trying to change his will to get our way. That is not the purpose of prayer. But to secure for ourselves and for others blessings that God is already willing to grant, but that are made conditional on our asking for them. Blessings require some effort, work or effort on our part before we can obtain them. How can we be assured that God will in fact answer our prayers and give us those things which we seek from his hands? To his saint, faithful saints, he gives this blanket promise, ask and ye shall receive. And the whole concept of effectual prayer is summarized in the course to the Nephites that whatsoever they ask the Father in his name, which is good and right, believing that they should receive, would be given unto them. 3rd Nephi 18.20 Remember, that which is good and right. If you pray for something that is not good and right and God knows for your salvation, he is not going to answer that. 
How would you know if something is good or right? You need to be praying by the Spirit of the Holy Ghost. The key then is to have faith to believe that the blessing sought shall be forthcoming. And as Joseph Smith expressed it on one uh, one of the things that is necessary in order that any rational and intellectual being may exercise faith in God unto life and salvation is an actual knowledge that the course of life which he is pursuing is according to his will. Thus, faith is a gift of God bestowed as a reward for personal righteousness. It is always given when righteousness is present. And the greater the measure of obedience to God's laws, the greater will be the endowment of faith. Hence, the prophet says that to acquire faith, men must gain the actual knowledge that the course of life they pursue is according to the will of God, in order that they may be able to exercise faith in him unto life and salvation. This knowledge supplies an important part in revealed religion. For it was by reason of it that ancients were able to endure as seeing him who is invisible. An actual knowledge to any person that the course of life which he pursues is according to the will of God is essentially necessary to enable him to have the confidence in God without which no person can obtain eternal life. It was this that enabled the ancient saints to endure all their afflictions and persecutions and to take joyfully the spoiling of their goods, knowing not, knowing, not merely believing that they had a more enduring substance. That's from the Lectures on Faith, page 57. Accordingly, the secret of gaining answers to prayers is prior obedience to the Lord's law. If you will not harden your hearts, he says, but will ask in me in faith, believing that you will receive will with diligence in keeping my commandments, then the desired blessing shall be received. If I'm asking for something and a witness for something, and I have no intention in keeping the commandment of it, then I will not receive an answer. 1 John 3, 23-24 Surely all the commandments are summarized in this one decree. Believe in Christ and love one another, which causes us to dwell in God and thus brings the blessings of God's Spirit to dwell in Him. Let's now turn to 1 John chapter 4. Try the, the Spirit's introduction. Two spirits are abroad in the earth. One is of God, the other of the devil. The spirit which of God is one that leads to light, truth, freedom, progress, and every good thing. On the other hand, the spirit which is Lucifer leads to darkness, error, bondage, retrogression, and everything evil. One spirit is from above, the other from beneath. And that which is from beneath never allows more light or truth or freedom to exist than it can help. All religion, philosophy, education, science, governmental control indeed, all things are influenced and governed by one or the other. In some cases, part by one and part by the other of these spirits. It should be understood that these two influences in the world are manifested through the ministration of actual spiritual personages from the unseen world. The power and influence wielded by Satan is exercised through the host of evil spirits who do his bidding and who have power according to the laws that exist to impress their wills upon the minds of receptive mortals. On the other hand, much of the power and influence of deity is exercised by the manif exercised by and manifested through spirit beings who appear and give revelation and guidance as the Lord's purposes may require. In general, the more righteous and saintly a person is, the easier it will be for him to receive communication from heavenly resources. And the more evil and corrupt he is, the easier it will be for evil spirits to implant their nefarious schemes in the minds and hearts. The problem that most men have is to discern the spirits so that they may know what is of God and what is not. The gift of the sermont, that is the gift of spirits, is itself one of the gifts of the spirit which comes from God. Believe not every spirit, John counseled, 
but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. How can we try the spirits? By what test shall it be known whether they are of God or the devil? If a messenger appear from the unseen world, how shall we know whether he is good spirit or an evil spirit? When a revelation is received, is it one born of light or darkness? When trances, visions, tongues, enchantments, miracles, and relations, related things come to view, are they from above or from beneath? When a philosophy is taught, a doctrine preached, a religion proclaimed, an educational theory espoused, how shall we know whether it is true or false? We may look for angels and receive their ministrations, the prophet Joseph Smith said, but we are to try the spirits and prove them, for it is often the case that men make a mistake in regard to these things. God has so ordained that when he has communicated no vision is to be taken but what you see by the seeing of the eye or but what you hear by the hearing of the ear. When you see a vision, pray for the interpretation. If you get not this, shut it up. There must be certainty in this matter. An open vision will manifest that which is more important. Lying spirits going forth in the earth. There will be great manifestations of spirits, both false and true. Not every spirit or vision or singing is of God. A part of a long discussion of true and false spirits and explaining how they may be distinguished, the prophet Joseph Smith said, No man can do this without the priesthood and having a knowledge of the laws by which spirits are governed. For as no man knows the things of God but by the Spirit of God, so no man knows the spirit of the devil and his power and influence, but by possessing intelligence which is more than human, and having unfolded through the medium of the priesthood the mysterious operations of his devices. A man, a man must have the discerning of spirits before he can drag into daylight this halish influence and unfold it unto the world in all its soul-destroying diabolical and horrid colors. For nothing is a greater injury to the children of men than to be under the influence of false spirits when they think they have the Spirit of God. Thousands have felt the influence of this terrible power and baneful effects. Long pilgrimages have been undertaken, penances endured, and pain, misery, and ruin have followed in their train. Nations have been convulsed, kingdoms overthrown, providence laid to waste, blood, carnage, and desolation are habiliments, habiliments in which it has been clothed. And as we have noticed before, the great difficulty lies in the ignorance of the nature of spirits, of the laws by which they are governed, and the signs by which they are known. It requires the Spirit of God to know the things of God, and the spirit of the devil can only be unmasked through that medium. Then it follows as a natural consequence that unless some person or persons have a communication or revelation from God, unfolding to them the operation of the Spirit, they must eternally remain ignorant of these principles. For I contend that if one man cannot understand these things, but by the Spirit of God, ten thousand men cannot. It is alike out of the reach of the wisdom of the learned, the tongue of the eloquent, the power of the mighty. And we shall at last have to come to this conclusion. Whatever we may think of revelation, that without it we can neither know nor understand anything of God or the devil. And however unwilling the world may be to acknowledge this principle, it is evident from the mefarious multifarious creeds and notions concerning this matter that they understand nothing of this principle and it is equally as plain that without divine communication they must remain in ignorance. It follows that the discerning of spirits is and can be practiced in righteousness only when the true church and kingdom of God is found. 
In the final analysis, it takes apostles, prophets, priesthood, the gift of the Holy Ghost, and a knowledge of God's laws and the manner in which he operates in order to separate the spirits <clears throat> into two opposing camps. Only when these things are found can error be segregated from truth, because only they, there are the channels of revelation open. End of Joseph Smith's quote. The way you can know whether something is from the Spirit of God in Revelation if it causes you to do good. Read Moroni chapter 7 very carefully. Satan cannot cause anyone to do good. So if something, a revelation, or a prompting or impression causes you to do good, that is from God. We do not do that ourselves. You can know for a surety that that is from God. 1 John 4, 1 through 3, and 2 John 1, 7, believe not every spirit. Some individuals in the church were teaching that Jesus Christ did not have a physical body. John referred to these people as spirits who possessed the spirit of Antichrist. Their opinion was that Jesus Christ only seemed to have a physical body and to suffer and die on the cross. John exhorted his readers to believe not every spirit, but to try the spirits, whether they are God, of God. In this case, the test that determines true teachers was whether they taught that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. The existence of similar teachings is also evident in Paul's writings. So even today, if someone preaches God and Christ do not have a physical personal body, then they are not of the spirit of Christ. They are of the spirit of the devil. Brigham Young added the following to the definition of the Antichrist of our day, saying, quote, The time was when the test of a Christian was his confession of Christ. In the first epistle of John 1, it is written, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby ye know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. Wherefore ye have heard that it shall come, and even now already is in the world. This is, not, this is no test to this generation. For all men of the Christian world confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This generation, however, is not left without a test. I have taught for 30 years and still teach that he that believeth God and he that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and sent Joseph Smith with the fullness of the gospel to this generation is not of God, but is anti-Christ. That is how we can know in our day anyone who does not believe in the divine in the divine calling of the prophet Joseph Smith, and that Christ called him to do what he did, is Antichrist. All who confess that Joseph Smith is sent of God in the last days to lay the foundation of his everlasting kingdom, no more to be thrown down, and will continue to keep his commandments, are born of God. All those who believe in their hearts and confess with their mouths that Joseph Smith is a true prophet, at the same time, trying with their might to live the holy principles Joseph the prophet has revealed are in possession of the Holy Spirit of God and are, and are entitled to a fullness. End of quote. That's in the Journal of Discourses 9, pages 312 through 313. 1 John 4, 4. The true saints have overcome the spirit of Antichrist in the world because they believe and know the truth about God and Christ. 1 John 4, 5, false prophets, false teachers, advocates of doctrines or policies or philosophies or feelings on spirits that are not of God, all of these are of the world, and so naturally they are accepted by worldly people. 1 John 4, 6, John is teaching to catch the full import of this inspired utterance, apply it to the Lord's people in this day. We Latter-day Saints are of God. We alone have the truth. We alone have the gospel. We alone can save men in the celestial kingdom. Unless men hear us and receive our message, they shall be damned. 
What we have is true. What the world has is error. All things are judged by the gospel standard which we have. How plainly and bluntly John and all the apostles speak as the Holy Ghost rests upon them. 1 John 4, 7-11, God is love. Forms of the words love appear more than 20 times in 1 John 4. John taught that love is of God, that God is love, and that God's love was manifested in the gift of his only begotten Son. Elder Jeffrey All Holland similarly expressed that Christ came to demonstrate the love of God for his children, quoting, Feeling the, feeding the hungry, healing the sick, rebuking hypocrisy, pleading for faith. This was Christ showing us the way of the Father. He who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, long-suffering, and full of goodness. In his life, and especially in his death, Christ was declaring, This is God's compassion. I am showing you as well as that of my own. And in the spirit of the holy apostleship, I say, as did one who held this office anciently, here then is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loves us, we also ought to love one another and to love him forever, I pray. End of quote. This does not mean that God's love is unconditional or that he will accept us into his kingdom in our sin, no matter what we have done. As a noun, God's love is infinite and eternal for all of his children. However, as a verb, God's love that was manifested by sending his only begotten son to atone for the sins of the world to bring about the gift of repentance and exaltation is conditional upon our obedience to his laws, ordinances, and covenants. Alma 42, 12, 13 says, And now there was no means to reclaim men from the fallen state which man had brought upon himself because of his own disobedience. Therefore, according to justice, the plan of redemption could not be brought about only upon conditions of repentance of men in this proba probationary state. Yea, this probationary state, for except it were for these conditions, mercy could not take effect except it should be destroy the work of justice. Now the work of justice could not be destroyed. If so, God would not would God would cease to be God. So having the love of God to save us in exaltation is based upon the conditions of repentance. It is conditional. Helaman 14, 17 through 18 put it this way, But behold, the resurrection of Christ redeemeth mankind, yea, even all mankind, and bringeth them back into the presence of the Lord. That is unconditional. That will happen to everyone automatically. Back to the verse, yea, and it bringeth to, to pass the condition of repentance, that whosoever repenteth the same is not hewn down and cast into the fire. But whosoever repenteth is not hewn down and cast into the fire. And there cometh upon them again a spiritual death, yea, a second death, for they are cut off as to things pertaining to righteousness. 1 John 4, 7, the love of God. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. Conversely, hate is of the devil from whom everything, every evil thing flows. The phrase, everyone that loveth is born of God, John is meaning, God, gospel love consists of and is manifest through obedience to the laws and ordinance of the gospel, in consequence of which those who truly love their brethren in full measure are persons who have already been born again. And conversely, as John here states the proposition, those who love their brethren in the full gospel sense thereby show they have been born again. The phrase in verse 7, everyone that loveth knoweth God, means as the presence of true gospel love is proof positive that the receipt has been born again, the recipient has been born again, so also on the same basis it establishes that he knows God to whom to know is eternal life. This knowledge comes only by revelation from the Holy Ghost, and of course, he that loveth not God, he that loveth not knoweth, 
He that loveth not knoweth not God. 1 John 8, God is love. Our God is a consuming fire. God is light. Similarly, God is also hope, faith, hope, charity, righteousness, truth, virtue, temperance, patience, humility, and so forth. That is God. God is the embodiment and personification of every good grace and godly attribute, all of which dwell in his person in perfection and in holiness. No wonder we sing how great thou art. 1 John 4, 9-10 These verses are John's commentary upon Jesus' words, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's from the Gospel of John 3.16. Propitiation for our sins means that Christ appeased the demands of divine justice and effected a reconciliation between God and man. 1 John 4.11, God and Christ are the great prototypes of all saved beings. They are our parents, our exemplars. To our patterns, I'm sorry, our exemplars. To be saved is to be like them. If they manifest perfect and infinite love, such is the goal towards which we must strive. The Joseph Smith translation of 1 John 4.12, No man hath seen God at any time except them who believe, who was and does, and who has and does and shall see God. Prophets in great numbers have seen the Lord, have often receiving such plain and open manifestation that it has been as though they communed with their friends. Of one of these, John himself, who, like Joseph Smith, was able to describe the clothing he wore, the appearance of his hair, eyes and feet, and the sound of his voice. It's in Revelations 2, 13 through 15. One of the appearances of the Lord to Moses, the record says, the Lord talked with Moses, and the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friends. Exodus 33, 9 through 11. And Abraham recorded his similar experience with the same God in these words. I, Abraham, talked with the Lord face to face, as one man talketh with another, and his hand was stretched out. Abraham 3, 11 through 12. I also saw the Lord sitting upon the throne high, lifted up, and his train and his skirts filled the temple, Isaiah said. And the brother of Jared saw the spirit body of the Lord Jesus in such detail that it appeared even as his mortal and resurrected body should appear. But the most glorious theophany of which we have recorded is the vision of vouchsafed to Joseph Smith when he saw two personages, the Father and the Son, standing above him in glory and brightness, which defy all description. And as with the prophets and seers of ancient modern times, so with all the saints who will obey the same laws, all shall see the Lord, for God is no respecter of persons. Verily thus saith the Lord, he decrees, it shall come to pass that every soul who forsakes his sins comes unto me and calleth on my name and obeyeth my voice and keepeth my commandments shall see my face and know that I am. That's Dr. Cummins 93.1. And again, sanctify yourselves that your minds become single to God, and the days will come that he, ye shall see him, for he will unveil his face unto you, and it shall be in his own time and in his own way and according to his own will. Doctrine and Covenants 88, 68. 1 John 4, 12. God dwelleth in us. And in verse 16, he that dwelleth in us, in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. God dwells in the hearts of the righteous, not literally, but by the power of the Spirit. What beautiful imagery this is! How well it teaches the perfect unity that should prevail among all the saints and between God and the gospel. Jesus Christ is in you, Paul says to the saints. How can this be? His answer is simple. We have the mind of Christ. God dwells in the hearts of those who are as he is. If you wish to go where God is, you must be like God or possess the principles which God possesses. The prophet said, the prophet Joseph Smith, to possess the principles which God possesses is to dwell in God. 
That is, if we possess love, charity, faith, and every godly attribute as he possesses them, then he dwells in us because we have received those attributes which come from him, and we dwell in him because we have become as he is. The phrase, if we love one another, God dwelleth in us, meaning, as only those who love their fellow men are born of God and know God. See, so also they, they alone are the ones in whom God dwells. And again, the governing principle is that the love involved can be developed only as a result of keeping the commandments. For John 14, 3, the extent to which the saints receive the companionship and guidance of the Holy Spirit is the extent to which they dwell in God. First John 14, 15, those who have testimonies of the gospel are in fact converted to its eternal truth are the ones in whom God dwells and also who dwell in him. 1 John 4, 17, the phrase, as he is, so are we. We become like God as we acquire the attributes he possesses. 1 John 4, 18, perfect love casteth out fear. For the church members John addressed, fear would have been a natural response to the hostilities they faced. However, John wrote that perfect love casteth, casteth out fear. Joel, Elder Joseph B. Worthen of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles related an experience from the life of Elder James E. Talmage that illustrates how Christ-like love casts out fear. Quote, Elder James E. Talmage, a man who is remembered for his doctrinal teaching, showed great kindness to a neighbor family in distress. They were complete strangers to him. Before he was an apostle, as a young father, he became aware of great suffering at a neighbor's home, whose large family was stricken with the deadly, or the dreaded diphtheria. He did not care that they were not members of the church. His kindness and charity moved him to act. The Relief Society was desperately trying to find people to help, but no one would because of the contagious nature of the disease. When he arrived, James found one toddler already dead and two others who were in agony from the disease. He immediately went to work cleaning the untidy house, preparing the young body for burial, cleaning it and providing for the other sick children, spending the entire day doing so. He came back the next morning to find that one more of the children had died during the night. A third child was still suffering terribly. He wrote in his journal, She clung to my neck oft times coughing germs on my face and clothing, yet I could not put her from me. During the half hour immediately perce perceiving her death, I walked the floor with the little creature in my arms. She died in agony at 10 a.m. The three children had all departed within the space of 24 hours. He then assisted the family with the burial arrangements and spoke at their graveside service. This he did all for a family of strangers. What a great example of Christ-like kindness. End of quote. Our Lord's message is one of love and joy and hope and eternal life. Fear plays no part in it. There is no dread or disquiet in the souls of the saints. They are free from apprehension and anxiety with reference to the course of evidence in this world and the eternal destiny in the world to come. To them, their Lord's voice is, Fear not, little children, for you are mine, and I have overcome the world, and you are of them that, are, that my Father hath given me, and none of them that my Father hath given me shall be lost. I, may I make a mention now of those of us like me who suffer from an anxiety disorder. This is not the kind of fear they're talking about in the scriptures. Those who have anxiety disorders, but still, with the best they can, keep their hearts, attend church, have faith in Christ, are keeping the commandments and are fearing not, even though anxiety causes fear. The fear that they're talking about here is the worldly fear of the persecution of the world, not those who have a disorder. That is not the kind of fear he is referring to. God will help those who have that and help strengthen them 
through those particular disorders. That I know through personal experience. Let's go to 1 John now, chapter 5. Saints are born of God through belief in Christ. 1 John 5, 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, except in miraculous and unusual circumstances, as with Alma, spiritual rebirth is a process. It does not occur instantaneously. It comes to pass by degrees. Repentant persons become alive to one spiritually react become alive to one spiritual reality after another until they are wholly alive in Christ and are qualified to dwell in his presence forever. Similarly, conversion is a process and sanctification is a process. They increase in the hearts of the disobedience in the process of time as they move more fully, keep the commandments, and seek the Lord. Spiritual rebirth begins and ends with belief in Christ. When repentant souls turn to Christ and seek a new life with Him, the process of rebirth commences when their belief in the Lord increases until they are able to do the works that He does and greater works than these, their rebirth is perfect and they are prepared for salvation with Him. The phrase, everyone that loveth him that begat, begat loveth him also, that is begotten of him, means everyone that loveth Christ, who begets us spiritually, and whose children we become when we are born again, loveth his brethren also. For his brethren have been adopted into the same family with him, and have a special kinship with him. 1 John 5, 33 the commandments of God are not grievous. The supreme manifestation of our love for our fellow man is for us to keep the commandments of God. For in doing so, we do those things which further the salvation of all our children, father's children. As an extension of his teaching on love, 1 John 4, John reminded his readers that we demonstrate our love for God by keeping his commandments, which are not grievous. Elder Joseph B. Wurzlin taught that when we obey the commandments out of love, obedience ceases to be grievous. Quote, Do you love the Lord? Spend time with him. Meditate on his words. Take his yoke upon you. Seek to understand and obey because this is the love of God that he keepeth his commandments. When we love the Lord, obedience ceases to be a burden. Obedience becomes a delight. President Ezra Taft Benson put it most poignantly when he said, When obedience ceases to be an irritant and becomes our quest, in that moment God will endow us with power. I have come to know it is a lot easier to obey Christ and the commandments than to live after the manner of the world. 1 John 4, 5, 4 through 5, He that overcometh the world. John pointed out that our faith in Jesus Christ allows us to overcome the world. To read about the blessings that come to those who overcome the world, see Revelation 2, 11, verse 17, 26, 28, and then chapter 3, 5, verses, and verses 12 and 21. 1 John 5, 6 to 8, three that bear witness in earth, meaning certain phrases may have been added in 1 John 5, 7 through 8, as late as the 4th century A.D. The apparent addition is the words in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, and these three that bear witness in earth. Whether these words reflect John's original writings or were added later by an unknown person is debated. What is important is that these verses emphasize the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ was part of the atonement of Jesus Christ's real suffering. This truth refutes the doctetic heresy that Jesus Christ did not have a mortal body. Water, blood, and spirit are related to mortal birth. Spiritual rebirth, the Savior's atoning sacrifice, as the following chart illustrates. There was water. The child is surrounded by water in the womb. Spiritual worth, baptism is performed by immersion in water. Christ's atoning sacrifice, while on the cross, water flowed from Christ's pierced side. The symbol of blood, mortal birth, the life of the body, 
is in the blood. The mother's blood is shed during childbirth, spiritual rebirth. Christ's atoning blood allows us to be born again. Christ's atoning sacrifice. Christ shed his blood for all mankind. The element of spirit, immortal birth, each person's born immortality is literally the spirit offspring of heavenly parents having received the spirit body in the premortal world. Spiritual rebirth, the Holy Ghost, has cleansing power. Christ's atoning sacrifice. Through Christ's atoning sacrifice, the perfect spirituality, we are able to be born again and receive spiritual sanctification. John 5, 9, God himself in his very nature of that birth into mortality, which he has provided for his spirit children, bears witness both of the atonement of his son and of the essential elements in the plan of salvation itself. John 5, 10, God testifies by the power of the Holy Ghost that Jesus Christ is his son. If we reject this witness, we call God a liar. But we believe in Christ and know by revelation that he is the Son of God. 1 John 5.12 He that believeth on the Son hath eternal life, and he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth in him. 1 John 5.13 The phrase, ye have eternal life, meaning, if ye shall press forward, feast upon the words of Christ, and endure to the end, behold, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. 1 John 5, 14 through 15. This is the absolute ultimate in the absolute ultimate in faith. To know our petitions will be granted because they accord with the mind and will of the Lord. 16. A sin unto death. Those who turn from the light and the truth of the gospel, who give themselves up to Satan, who enlist in his cause, supporting and sustaining that, and who thereby become his children, by such a course sin unto death. For them there is neither repentance, forgiveness, nor any hope whatsoever of salvation of any kind. As children of Satan, they are the sons of perdition. Whoso bringeth forth evil works, the same becometh a child of the devil, for he hearkens unto his voice, and doth follow him. And whosoever doeth this must receive his wages of him. Therefore, for his wages he receiveth death as to things pertaining unto righteousness, being dead unto all good works. Alma 5, 41 through 42. In the sense that no murder hath eternal life abideth in him, First John 3, 15, that is, that none guilty of premeditated murder can ever gain celestial kingdom. Murder also is a sin unto death. Such persons can never enjoy spiritual life. It appears that there are some special circumstances under which adultery, in this sense, is also a sin unto death, as witnessed by the prophet Joseph Smith's de declaration, If a man commit adultery, he cannot receive the celestial kingdom of God. Even if he is saved in any kingdom, it cannot be the celestial kingdom. End of quote. It may be that there are other abominable things which men in certain circumstances can do which will bar them eternally from the receipt of spiritual life. 1 John 5.18, the Joseph Smith translation of this verse as important additions. The bolded are the things Joseph Smith added. We know that whosoever is born of God continueth not in sin. See, he added that changes the whole verse. But he that is begotten of God and keepeth himself, that wicked one overcometh him not. 1 John 5, 19, DNC relates to DNC 84, 49 to 53. And the whole world lieth in sin and groaneth under darkness and under the bondage of sin. And by this you may know they are under the bondage of sin because they become not of me. For whosoever cometh not unto me is under the bondage of sin. And whoso receiveth not my voice is not acquainted with my voice and is not of me. And by this you may know the righteous from the wicked. And the whole world groaneth under, this, under sin and darkness even now. 
1 John 20 through 21. John concludes with his testimony that he knows that the Son of God has come and so taught that we could have understanding of the gospel and know of the truthfulness of his mortal probation. Those who believe and act upon his knowledge are in him, and this is life eternal that they might know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. John 17.3 Then end with this admonition to keep ourselves from idols, which according to Doctrine and Covenants 116 is, to seek not the Lord to establish his righteousness, but every man walketh in his own way, after the image of his own God, whose image is in the likeness of the world, and whose substance is that of an idol. So when we try to do things our way instead of God's way, that is idol worship, no matter what that is. If I don't want to forgive somebody, that's idol worship, because that's my way instead of God's way. Let's now turn to the second book of John. Chapter 1. In this epistle, John expressed concern over apostate influences in the church. At the same time, he also expressed joy for the church members who had remained strong and loyal. This rejoicing illustrates the joy and gratitude that church leaders, both ancient and modern, feel for those who remain faithful to the Lord. John reminded his readers that in spite of Antichrist who try to deceive, they must not lose the spiritual progress they have made. The second epistle of John was written to the elect lady and her children. Since the epistle addresses a group of people, many commentators conclude that the elect lady actually refers to the Christian congregation. The Greek term for church is feminine, and it was, commonly, it was common to personify the church as a woman. Another possibility is that the elect lady and her children were John's wife and family. John apparently wrote this epistle for the same purpose as 1 John, responding to Docetic teachings. He testified that Jesus Christ literally came to the earth in the flesh, labeling those who taught otherwise as Antichrist. He explained that members who taught that Christ did not have a physical body should be cast out of the congregation. In this epistle, John warned about false teachers who had entered into the church. John warned church members not to heed or befriend these individuals. Let's take a look now at 2 John 1. John rejoices because of the children of the elect lady are true and faithful. 2 John 1, 1 through 5, the elect lady. John described himself as the elder. The elect lady he was writing to is either a figurative reference to a branch of the church or a literal reference to a female member, perhaps even his wife. Elder Bruce R. McConkie, taking a literal approach, said, An elect lady is a female member of the church who has already received or who through obedience is qualified to receive the fullness of gospel blessings. This includes temple endowments, celestial marriage, and the fullness of the sealing power. She is one who has been elected or chosen by faithfulness as a daughter of God in this life, an heir of God, a member of his household. Her position is comparable to that of the elders who magnify their callings in the priesthood and thereby receive all that the Father hath. See DNC 84.38. In the early days of this dispensation, Emma Smith, the prophet's wife, was in such complete harmony with the Lord's program that he forgave her of her sins and addressed her as an elect lady. John the Beloved used a similar situation to certain women in his day. Just as it is possible for the very elect to be deceived and to fall from grace through disobedience, so an elect lady, by, falling to endure, by failing to endure to the end, can lose her chosen status. The phrase for children whom I love in truth, John meant, is John writing a personal letter to a wife and expressing appreciation for their children. It is an acceptable thing for righteous parents to rejoice in the faith and the devotion of their children and to take pleasure in the fact that other members of the church view the conduct of those same children with approbation. John rejoiced that he found the children of the elect lady walking in truth and following the gospel of Jesus Christ. 2 John 1 verse 2, for the truth's sake. 
Every act of a true saint is performed for the truth's sake. That is, a faithful person chooses to only do those things which guide him to salvation and which further the Lord's work and purposes on earth. 2 John 1, six. If we truly love God and the Father and His Son Christ, then we will keep His commandments. His yoke is easy and His burden is light. Matthew 11.30 2 John 1, 7 through 10, many deceivers are entered into the world. John warned his readers that many deceivers are entered into the world. John advised the saints that if they encountered a false teacher, they should receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. John was not suggesting that the saints should fail to extend common courtesy to those who taught contrary doctrines. However, since early Christian congregations gathered to worship in the homes of church members, traditional customs of hospitality could inadvertently enable heretical teachings to infiltrate congregations. Elder Emerson Ballard, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, warned modern church members not to associate with deceivers and antichrists operating in our day. Quote, let us beware of false prophets and false teachers, both men and women, who are self-appointed declarers of the doctrines of the church and who seek to spread their false gospel and attract followers by sponsoring symposia, books, and journals whose contents challenge foundational doctrines of the church. Beware of those who speak and publish in opposition to God's true prophets, who actively proselyte others with reckless disregard for the eternal well-being of those whom they seduce. Perhaps more damningly, they deny Christ's resurrection atonement, arguing that no God can save us. They reject the need for a Savior. In short, these detractors attempt to reinterpret the doctrine of the church to fit their own preconceived views, and in the process, they deny Christ and his messianic role. End of quote. 2 John 2, 7, deceivers and antichrist try to promote the idea of Nazareth, that Jesus of Nazareth is not the Messiah and teach that there should be no Christ, just as Korahor did. The full pattern of such teachings include attacks on revelation, prophets, resurrection, ecclesiastical authority, and promotion of skepticism, empiricism, survival of the physicist, survival of the fittest, naturalism, and moral relativism. Those are all foul fallacies, and those are all false doctrines of the devil. First, Second John, uh, chapter two, verses ten through eleven. It is a sin to assist and uphold those who preach false doctrine and who run counter to the divine will. By so doing, the saints become partakers of their evil deeds and shall be condemned accordingly. Second John chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. Is John writing to his family, giving them love, blessings, and counsel while he is dwelling somewhere else with another family? Perhaps that of Gaius, to whom his third epistle was addressed. Let's just change all these really quick. These should all have a two in front of them that these are in chapter two. Let's now turn to the third book of John. Third John Introduction. In this brief epistle, John praises Gaius, a church member who was loyal during a time of re rebellion against church leaders. John's teaching provide insights on apostasy in the New Testament church and can inspire modern saints to remain faithful to church leaders despite opposition. The epistle in 3 John was written to Gaius, a faithful member of the church, whom God praised for showing unselfish devotion to the cause of Christ by providing accommodations for God's traveling servants. John also warned Gaius about one Diotrephus, who may have held a local leadership position in the church or perhaps was the host of a local church congregation. 
Diotrephes openly opposed John and other church officials and even prevented local church members who wished to receive the church officials from attending or speaking in church meetings. John encouraged Gaius to continue in goodness and inform him that he would soon visit him. In 3 John, we see John's concern about apostate influences in the church. We also see John's love for others and the joy he felt for those who are choosing life of obedience. 3 John 1, 10, Diophilus rejected the authority of John. Diophilus was apparently either a leader in a local branch or the host of a house church. John noted that because Diotheus loved to have preeminence among the saints, he rejected the authority of John and other church leaders. Concerning people like Di Diotrephius, the prophet Joseph Smith wrote, It is the natural disposition of almost all men, as soon as they get a little authority, as they suppose, they willingly immediately begin to exercise unrighteous dominion. President James E. Faust, the first presidency, cautioned, there is a certain arrogance in thinking that any of us may be more spiritually intellect, more learned, or more righteous than the councils called to preside over us. Those councils are more in tune with the Lord than any individual person they preside over. End of quote. Third John three eleven. God can only come good can only come from God. God can only Good can only come from God. Satan is not able to persuade any to do good. Let's quote Moroni 7, 13 and verses 16 through 17. It says, But behold, that which is of God inviteth and enticeth to do good continually. Wherefore, everything which inviteth and enticeth to do good and to love God and to serve him is inspired of God. For behold, the Spirit of Christ is given to every man that he may know good from evil. Wherefore I show unto you the way to judge. For everything which inviteth to do good and persuadeth to believe in Christ is sent forth by the power and gift of the Holy Ghost. That's how you can know whether it came from yourself or from the Spirit. Question I was asked for 35 years teaching seminary every year, millions of times. Brother Clough, how do I know whether it's me thinking it or from the Holy Ghost? Well, Anything that invites you to do good and persuade to believe in Christ has come forth by the power and gift of Christ. Wherefore, you may know with the perfect knowledge it is of God. But whatsoever thing persuadeth men to do evil and believe not in Christ and denieth him and serveth not God, then you may know with the perfect knowledge it is of the devil. For after this manner doth the devil work. For he, the devil, persuadeth no man to do good. No, not one. Neither do his angels, neither do they who subject themselves to him. Satan cannot cause or any of his followers stuck to, to do good. That's how you can know it's of God. Ether 4.12 says, And whatsoever thing persuadeth men to do good is of me. For good cometh of none, save it be of me. See, we do not do that even within our own selves. Anything that causes us to do good is of God. I am the same that leadeth all men to do good. This is one way to know if an impression you receive is from God or yourself. If it causes you to do good, then it is from God. And doing good means progressing towards God. Anything that causes you to progress towards God. Let's now finish with the book of Jude. Jude introduction. This epistle follows readers to understand Jude's earnest concern about the forces of apostasy that were at work in the church near the end of the first century A.D. The author identifies himself as Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Traditionally, the author has been understood to be Jude, the half-brother of Jesus Christ. See Matthew 13.55 and Mark 6.3. Jude was evidently an active church member of high esteem in Jerusalem and had traveled as missionary. Though Jude does not appear to have held a prominent position in the early church, early Christians held his epistle in sufficient esteem to include it in the New Testament canon. 
Jude is a general epistle addressed to faithful Christians, to them that are sanctified of God the Father and preserved in Christ Jesus. Jude's stated purpose was to encourage his readers to earnestly contend for the faith against ungodly teachers who had entered the church promoting immoral behavior and false teachings that denied the Lord Jesus Christ. Some commentators have noted similarities between Jude and 2 Peter and suggested that one writer may have used the source, the other as a source, or that both drew from a common source. Jude 1, 4-9 is indeed similar in wording to 2 Peter 2. However, Peter was prophesying a future apostasy, whereas Jude spoke of apostasy that was currently taking place. Jude's words are sharp and incisive against those who oppose God and his servants. Jude cited scripture and Jewish apocry apocryphal accounts to show how God had dwelt in time's path with individuals who openly opposed his work. Ella Bruce R. McConkie noted several unique characteristics of Jude. Quote, In the whole Bible, it is Jude only who preserves for us the concept that pre-existence was our first estate and that certain angels failed to pass its test. It is to him that we turn for our meager knowledge of the disputation between Michael and Lucifer about the body of Moses. He alone records Enoch's glorious prophecy about the second coming of the Son of Man. Jude 1, contend for the faith. Jude 1, 1, Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ are separate beings. Jude's language in Jude 1, 1 conveys his belief that God the Father and Jesus Christ are separate beings. This is so pervasive throughout the New Testament that you can see how traditional Christianity has been deceived and following the teachings of Satan and saying that they are one in substance without body, passions, or emotions, or bark parts or anything. Jude 1.1, 1, 1, Elabusha McConkie wrote concerning Jude, quote, Jude, called Judas by Matthew and Judah by Mark and James were son of Joseph and Mary, and therefore brothers, strictly speaking, half-brothers of the Lord Jesus. With an appropriate sense of reverential awe, neither claimed in their epistles to be brothers of the Lord. After our Lord's resurrection, James became one of the council of the twelve and attained some prominence in the church. Quite naturally, Jude here identifies himself with his better-known brother. The phrase to them that are sanctified meant Jude is writing to members of who of the church to the saints who have been born of the water and of the spirit and have been cleansed from their sins and have been sanctified by the reception of the Holy Ghost. And only those in whose lives the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit is found can comprehend in full the meaning and import of his message. Jude 1 3 The faith which was once delivered unto the saints. According to Jude, he had originally intended to write about the common salvation, meaning the idea that salvation is available to all men, not just a select few. However, Jude instead found it needful to exhort his readers to earnestly contend for the faith which one was once delivered unto the saints. Here Jude was referring to the faith that was taught originally by Christ himself and then by his apostles, the same faith that we read about in the New Testament has been restored in our day and is found in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. President Wilford Woodruff related how, as a young man, he sought after the faith that had been taught by Jesus Christ and the apostles. Quote, I read the New Testament. I learned verse after verse, chapter after chapter. It taught me the gospel of life, salvation. It taught me a gospel of power before the heavens on the earth. It taught me the organization of the church consisting of prophets, apostles, pastors, and teachers. These are the things which I learned, and they made an impression upon me. I believed in them, yet I had never heard taught heard them taught by any clergyman or divine upon the earth. On one occasion, I attended one of those great meetings, which were sometimes held in Connecticut, at which 40 or 50 ministers of various denominations were gathered together. At this meeting, permission was given for anybody to make remarks. I was quite young. I rose and stepped into the aisle, and I said to that body of ministers, My friends, will you tell me why you don't contend for the faith once delivered to the saints? Will you tell me why you do not contend for the gospel that Jesus Christ and that his apostles taught? Why do you not contend for that religion that gives unto you power before God, 
power to heal the sick, to make the blind to see, the lame to walk, and that gives you the Holy Ghost and those gifts and graces that have been manifested from the creation of the world. The presiding elder said, My dear young man, you would be a very smart man, a very useful man in this earth, if you did not believe in all those foolish things. End of quote. Isn't that amazing that that's all they had to say about that? Wilford would have finally heard the gospel preached by an authorized servant of God, Elder Zara Pulsifer, and recognized it as what it had been what he had been searching for. He was baptized just a few days later. Jude one four through eight sinners in the past. Jude acknowledged the ongoing apostasy in the church as he described ungodly men who entered the ranks of the church without the awareness of the members who then taught false doctrine. Jude compared these rebellious individuals to people in the Old Testament times who were, dis were destroyed for disobedience. The Israelites who led out of the Egypt and later fell to forsake their sins and the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. Judah, uh, Judah, Jude also gave the example of angels in the premortal world who chose to rebel against God and follow Satan, verses 5 and 8. Jude used these examples to put his readers in remembrance of what awaits those who rebel against proper authority and fail to repent. Jude 1 3 Contend for the faith which, one, which was once delivered unto the saints. It is ever thus, Lucifer always has his ministers on earth. Wherever the truth is found, there is opposition in and out of the church. Ungodly men always arise to fight the pure and perfect religion which alone brings salvation. See, that's the law of the opposition. You can't have a true church unless you have false churches upon the earth. Cain and his descendants rebelled against Adam. Hosts of people opposed Enoch and his teachings. Only Noah's immediate family accepted his testimony. The father Abraham lived and reveled in idolatry. Even the Son of God himself was rejected, mocked, scourged, and crucified by his own. Is it, is it any wonder that inspired writers and preachers must everlastingly plead with the saints to be true to their covenants and uphold the eternal truths, which alone mag qualify men for salvation with those who ancient times who believe and obey the same laws? Is it any wonder that the Lord in, Lord's instructions to minister is, quote, Contend thou therefore morning by morning, and day after day, let thy warning voice go forth, and when the night cometh, let not the inhabitants of the earth slumber because of thy speech. The N C one twelve verse five. Jude 1 through 4, false teachers in and out of the church who assume the prerogative of leading the children of men to do so because of personal sin, because they have lascivious desires, because their evil deeds, because they are corrupt in spirit of their profession of religion. Those who keep the commandments and enjoy the companionship of the Holy Ghost do so not, do not oppose the truth. Jude 1 5. Even though the Lord saved from Israel from Egypt, bond, let me try it again. Even though the Lord saved Israel from the Egyptian bondage, he later destroyed many of them because of their unbelief. So it is with members of the church. Even though they escape the world when they come into the Lord's earthly kingdom, many shall be lost because of subsequent unbelief and rebellion. Jude 1 6, the angels which kept not their first estate. Jew wrote about the spirit who rebelled against God in the pre-mortal world and followed Lucifer, calling them angels which kept not their first estate. Here estate refers to a person's rank or position. Because these spirits rebelled against the Father, they lost their standing before God and did not qualify for the privilege of coming to mortality, our second estate. While serving as a member of the 70, Elder L. Lionel Kendrick discussed the premortal events that led to the casting out of Satan and his followers, quote, Lucifer used his divine gift of agency to make a decision that would lead to his eternal damnation. In bold opposition, he rebelled against God and kept not his first estate. A third part of the host of heaven turned he away from me, the Lord God, because of their agency. Even with the possibility of the eternal damnation, Heavenly Father would not take their agency from them. To do so would be counter to eternal law. 
As a result of the rebelliousness, Lucifer and his followers were cast out of heaven and forfeited the blessings of eternal life. End of quote. God will always honor our agency. If we don't want him or his spirit to be with us, then they will honor that agency and they will leave us alone. Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith wrote concerning our first estate. At the first organization in heaven, we were all present and saw the Savior chosen and appointed and the plan of salvation made and we sanctioned it. We were all there. We were all taught it. We all raised our hands to it except for the third part. We came to this earth that we might have a body and present it pure before God in the celestial kingdom. The great principle of happiness consists in having a body. The devil has no body, and herein is his punishment. End of quote. Joshua also said, They who have tabernacles have power over those who do not. And also the spirits in the eternal world are like the spirits in this world. When those who have come in this world and received tabernacles, then died, and again have risen and received glorified bodies, they will have an ascendancy over the spirits who have received no bodies, or kept not their first estate like the devil. The punishment of the devil was that he should not have a habitation like men. End of Joseph Smith's quote. Jude 1, 6, in everlasting chains. Lucifer and one third of the host of heaven are damned forever. For them there is no progression, no advancement, no light, only darkness to all eternity. Of them and of the sons of perdition who shall be added to their number, the Lord says, I will say unto them, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And now behold, I say unto you, Never at any time have I declared from mine own mouth that they should return. For where I am, they cannot come, for they have no power. Doctrine Covenants 29, 28 through 29. Jude 1, 7 through 8, the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah were ancient neighboring cities located somewhere near the Dead Sea, probably at its southern end. Jude said that these cities were destroyed because their people indulged in the sins of fornication and going after strange flesh. The fringe going after strange flesh refers to engaging in homosexual acts. If the adulterers and perver sexual pervert perverters of Sodom and Gomorrah suffered the vengeance of eternal fire, Jude says, why should these filthy dreamers who defile the truth think to escape? In their ignorance as brute beasts, they corrupt the course of nature. They are condemned with Cain, who slew Abel, with Balaam, who divined for hire, and with Korahor and his band, who were slain for the rebellion against Moses and Aaron. Not Korahor, but Korah, sorry. And yet with it all, no railing accusations are intended, for even the archangel left commendation to the Lord as witness the affairs about the body of Israel's lawgiver. Jude 1, 9, Michael contending with the devil for the body of Moses. We get this strange thing put in Jude just all of a sudden about contending for the body of Moses. Jude 1, 9 says that Michael, the archangel, who we know as Adam, disputed with the devil over the body of Moses. Elder Bruce R. McConkie gives a thorough exposition concerning Michael, Satan, and the body of Moses. Quote, what then was this dispute between Michael and Satan all about? As it happens, this is our scriptural allusion to it, although it seems perfectly clear that Jude had before him some other scriptures bearing on the point. Its use as an illustration here is manifestly intended to clarify rather than confuse the doctrine being taught, and the fact relative thereto must have been known to and understood by the saints of that day. Continuing Elder McConkie, commentators assume, and it surely must have been so, that Jude had before him and was, was quoting from a then current apocryphal book, The Assumption of Moses, which has been preserved to us in fragmentary form only. This non canonical work presents the doctrine that Moses was translated and taken up into heaven without tasting death. It appears to deal with certain revelations made by Moses and with his disappearance in a cloud so that his death was hid from human sight. Michael was commissioned to bury Moses. 
Satan opposed the burial on the grounds, A, that he was the Lord of matter, and that according to the body should be rightfully handed over to him, and B, that Moses was a murderer, having slain the Egyptian. Michael, having rebuted Satan's accusations, proceeded to charge Satan with having instigated the serpent to tempt Eve. Finally, all opposition having been overcome, the assumption took place in the presence of Joshua and Caleb. Another Hebrew apocalypse tells us Moses' transformation into a form of a fiery angel and his ascent through the seven heavens. And yet another deals with the temporary translation of Moses before his death into heaven. When translated into heaven, the heavenly Jerusalem and temple were revealed to him, and he was told that these would descend to earth after God had gathered Israel a second time from the ends of the earth. Included in these same works were a number of statements not found in the Bible, but known by revelation through Joseph Smith to be true, as the fact of a pre-existence for all men, and that Moses was prepared from the foundation of the world to be the mediator of God's covenant with his people, and that during his life Moses was Israel's intercession with God." That Moses was in fact translated is confirmed by President Joseph Fielding Smith. After quoting from the prophet Joseph Smith these words, President Fielding Smith said, The Savior Moses and Elias, Elijah in other words, gave the keys to Peter, James, and John on the mount when they were transfigured before him. President Smith says, From that we understand why Elijah and Moses were preserved from death because they had a mission to perform, and it had to be performed before the crucifixion of the Son of God, and it could not be done in the Spirit. They had to have tangible bodies. Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection. Therefore, if any form, former prophets had a work to perform preparatory to the mission of the Son of God or to the dispensation of the meridian of times, it was essential that they be preserved to fulfill that mission in the flesh. For that reason, Moses disappeared from among the people and was taken up into the mountain. And the people thought that he was buried by the Lord. The Lord preserved him so that he could come at the proper time and restore the keys on the heads of Peter, James, and John who stood at the head of the dispensation of the meridian of time. He reserved Elijah from death that he might also come and bestow his keys upon the heads of Peter, James, and John, preparing them for their ministry. But one says the Lord could have waited until after his resurrection, and then they could have done it. It is quite evident due to the fact that it didn't, so occur that it had to be done before, and there was a reason. There may have been other reasons, but this is one reason why Moses and Elijah did not suffer death in the flesh like other men do. End of Elder McConkie's quote. So Elijah and Moses give keys to Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration. And they need tangible bodies to place their hands upon their heads. And that's why they were translated and saved for that time period, because they couldn't be resurrected because Christ hadn't been resurrected yet. Moses, Elijah, and Alma the Younger were translated. The Old Testament account that Moses died and was buried by the hand of the Lord is an unknown in an unknown grave is an error. It is true that he may have been buried by the hand of the Lord if that expression is a figure of speech, which means he was translated. But the Book of Mormon account in the recording that Alma was taken up by the Spirit says, The Scripture saith the Lord took Moses unto himself, and we suppose that he has also received Alma in the Spirit unto himself. It should be remembered that the Nephites had the brass plates, and that they were the scriptures which gave the account of Moses being taken away by way of translation. As to Elijah, the account of being taken in a chariot of fire by a whirlwind in heaven is majest majestically set out in the Old Testament in Second Kings chapter 2. 
It appears then that Satan, ever anxious to thwart the purpose of God, disputed about the body of Moses, meaning that he sought the mortal death of Israel's lawgiver so that he would not have a tangible body in which to come along with Elijah, who was also taken up without tasting death, to confer the keys of the priest of Peter, James, and John. So you can see Satan here trying to thwart the plan of God and keeping Moses from having that translated body. Jude 1, Michael the Archangel, our great prince Michael, known immortality as Adam, stands next to Christ in the eternal plan of salvation and progression. In pre-existence, Michael was the most intelligent, powerful, a mighty spirit son of God who was destined to become to this earth exceptionally accepting only the firstborn, under whose direction and pursuant to whose counsel he worked. He is the father of the human family and presides over all the spirits of all men. The name Michael apparently and with propriety means one who is like unto God. So Michael stands second next to Christ in authority. In the creation of the earth, Michael played a part, second only to that of Christ. When Lucifer rebelled, there was a war in heaven. It was Michael who led the host of the faithful in casting out Satan. When the time came to people the earth, the spirit Michael came and inhabited the body, inhabited the body formed from the dust of the earth, the living soul that, that thus created being known as Adam. As the first man, he filled his foreordained destiny of standing as the presiding high priest under Christ over all the earth. It is through him that Christ is revealed that all revelation comes through the Lord's affairs on earth are directed during the pre-millennial era. Three years previous to Adam's death, mortal death, he met in the valley of Adam on Diamond, where his righteous descendants and the Lord appeared unto them, and they rose up and blessed Adam and called him Michael, the prince, the archangel. Dr. Cummins 107.54 He will sit in council at this same place just prior to the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Those of all ages who have served under his direction in his ministry will give an accounting of their stewardship, and a son of man will come and receive Adam and all others of, of receive and all others a final accounting. That's the meeting that will be held prior to the second coming of Adam on Diamond, where all those holding keys will have to give an account of their stewardship. Michael contended with the devil over the body of Moses ministered comfort to the prophet Daniel, appeared to jo Joseph Smith to detect the devil when he appeared as an angel of light and to confer keys and authorities, and will hereafter partake of the sacrament with Christ and other righteous persons on earth. That's Doctrine and Covenant 1711. We also know that when he, that he was with Christ in the resurrection, that at the time of the end he shall fight the battle of the saints, that all the dead shall come forth from their graves at the sound of the trump, that he will lead the armies of heaven against the host of hell in the final battle when Lucifer is cast out eternally, and that he does all things under the counsel and direction of the Holy One, who is without beginning of days or end of life. Jude 1, verse 11, Cain, Balaam, and Kor. Jude compared false teachers to the rebellious Cain, Balaam, and Kor, or Korah, as it is spelled in the Old Testament, each of whom sinned grievously in the sight of the Lord. Cain murdered his brother Abel in order to gain his brother's flock. Balaam used God's given gift of prophecy to seek after riches and honor. And Korah rebelled against Moses because he was excluded from the priesthood office. In each instance, the Lord cursed these men for their wicked actions. Judah's epistles have helped his readers discern evil people of his day. His epistle can help us avoid similar apostate teachings in our own time. Jude 1, 12 through 13, the phrase spots in your feast of charity. Verse 12, without doubt, readers love feasts which may have been the intended reading here. So love feasts, 
instead of feasts of charity. These false teachers seem to have been involved in the sacred feast of brotherly love that in the early church accompanied the Lord's Supper. In fact, it appears that they injected their carousing into these holy observances and delighted in their shameful acts. The phrase feeding themselves without fear meant instead of feeding the sheep for whom they are responsible for. Clouds without water, referred to like clouds promising moisture, for the parched land the false teachers promise unsatisfying truth, but in the reality they have nothing to offer. Trees whose fruit wherewith, without fruit twice dead meant, once they were, they withered, and fruitless trees of winter who came alive with the baptism of spring, they now they were dead again because of apostasy and hence were destined to be plucked up by the roots and to die permanently. Raging waves, referring to as winds tossed, waves constantly churn up rubbish, so these apostates continually stir up more fulfilled. Wandering stars, referred to as shooting stars, appear in the sky only to fly off into eternal oblivion do these false teachers are destined for the outer darkness of eternal hell. Jude 1, 14 through 16, Enoch's prophecy. Jude alone recorded a prophecy of Enoch about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Jude may have quoted from the apocryphal book of Enoch, which is not in our present canon of scripture. The book of Moses, however, confirms that Enoch was given knowledge of the last days and of the Savior's second coming. See Moses 7, 62-66. On one occasion, the prophet Joseph Smith wrote that Enoch appeared to Jude. Verses 15-16, through 16, Enoch will come to convict the ungodly of all their ungodly acts, which are numerous, complainers, those who walk after their own lust, they boast about themselves and flatter others for their own advantage. Verse 16, outside persecution is not the most dangerous opposition encountered by the church in these latter days. Apostates from within produce the worst forms of antagonism. Jude 1, 17, remember ye the words which were spoken before by of the apostles. Jude urged his readers to remember the words which were spoken by the apostles. Safety is found in following apostolic direction. Elder Emerson Ballard expressed, quote, These are difficult times in the world's culture and sociological landmarks of propriety, honesty, integrity, and political correctness are constantly shifting. At such times, we might well ask, is there one clear, unpolluted, unbiased voice that we can always count on? Is there a voice that will always give us clear direction to find our way in today's troubling world? The answer is yes. That voice is the voice of the living prophet and apostles. Today, I make you a promise. It's a simple one, but it is true. If you will listen to the living prophet and apostles and heed our counsel, you will not go astray. End of his quote. Jude 1, 18-19, Mockers in the Last Days. Jude's reference to mockers in Jude 1, 18-19 probably refers to those who mock Christians in his day and applies to conditions in the world today. Those, who's most ag those who most aggressively mock the church and its standards are those who walk after their own godly lusts and who separate themselves from the believers because they do not have the Spirit. Jude one twenty, build up yourselves, meaning keeping the commandments, growing in grace, acquiring the attributes of godliness, working out your salvation. Salvation must be earned. It is free only in the sense that it is freely available to all those who will pay the price of righteousness. Your most holy phrased faith meant the gospel of Jesus Christ. What is more holy and glorious than the gospel which takes fallen man, carnal and sensual as he is, and changes him by obedience because of the atonement into a son of God. The phrase praying in the Holy Ghost meant praying by the power of the Holy Ghost so that all requests, petitions are granted because it shall be given of you what ye shall ask. That's the true meaning of prayer, is getting the Holy Ghost to tell us what to ask for in our prayers. Jude 121, keep the commandments and abide in the truth so as to be subject to the law of mercy and thereby gain eternal life. 
Jude 122, be tender and compassionate towards those who have doubts. Teach them correct principles and encourage them in righteousness. Jude 123, others save with fear. Meant, preach hellfire and damnation to those who need it. After telling his Nephite brethren of the destruction that awaited them unless they repented, Jacob said in 2 Nephi 9, 47-48, My brethren, it is expedient that you should awaken you to an awful reality of these things. Uh, would I harrow up your minds if your minds were pure? Would I be plain unto you according to the plainest of the truth if you were free from sin? Behold, if you are holy, I would speak unto you of holiness. That is such ye are not holy, and ye look unto me as a teacher. It must needs be expedient that I teach you of the consequences of sin. See, isn't that interesting? If you think about it, the Holy Ghost is going to inspire the apostles and prophets in general conference to speak on what we need. So we determine, according to the level of our righteousness, what they say. And so when President Nelson in one general conference in the first talk gets up and talks about abuse and verbal and physical and sexual abuse that we should knock it off. That is not a good sign of things that are happening in the church when that's one of the first talks he gives in general conference. We determine what they will say by our level of obedience. Verse 23, pulling them out of the fire. In the day of judgment, every corruptible thing will be consumed, and the wicked shall be burned with unquenchable fire. If the erring saints are to be saved, they must be pulled, as it were, from the coming fire, even as God said of Israel. Ye were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning. If the fire can scathe a green tree for the glory of God, how easy will it be, will burn up the dry trees to purify the vineyard? The phrase, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh, meant to stay the spread of disease in ancient Israel. Clothing spotted by contagious diseases were destroyed by burning. And so with sin in the church, the saints are to avoid the remotest contact with the very garments, as it were, of the sinners who are burned with fire, meaning that anything which has contact with pollutions of the wicked must be shunned. And so also with those yet in the world who are invited to join the kingdom. To them the call is repent, save yourselves from this untowards generation, and come forth out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted with the flesh. Jude 1, 24-25 After all the attention necessary given in this letter to the ungodly and their works of darkness, Jude concludes his letter by focusing attention on God, who is fully able to keep those who put their trust in him. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for watching. May we learn of these great principles. May we learn line upon line, precept upon precept, day after day, and continue in them until we receive the perfect light that we may become him. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button. Thank you.